Hi everyone, we'll start <clears throat> on top of the hour and um, this will be a really interesting discussion about um, learning in children and not just how kids just learn the fastest but also um, respecting their emotional well-being at the same time. So I think this is really uh, interesting project of Professor Sigmundson has been doing for years and um, it's very successful and um, yeah I think it's very encouraging because the style is to respect both the emotional well-being and also the, the learning skills so I'm looking forward to this discussion and in the meantime I will put up a Google document that has all the different links that are important or for further reading um, which you know there's a lot um, to dive into of the projects and work uh, professor sigmundson did over the years so yeah and the google doc there are all the different links to different papers that you should be able to access freely so hi andrew how are you i hope all is well hi aaron and um yeah we'll start soon uh, Karim, you raised your hand. Um, I tried to pull you up, but uh, I'm not sure if it's working right now. So um, check maybe in your profile uh, if there's an invitation. If you click on your profile, there should be maybe an invitation to, sp to speak. Hi, Katrina. Hi, how are you? How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm over the moon in the moment. And uh, yeah, Dr. Um, uh, Pro uh, Professor Sigmundson just arrived, Hermunda. Um, okay. Hi. Can you hear us? Uh, to unmute again, it's all the way on the bottom right. There's the little microphone symbol. And uh, if you click on that, you should be able to speak. Yes. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Now we can hear you. How Very are good. you? Yes, you I'm good. Time. You also? Yep. Good, good. <laughs> yes, very good. I'm here in, I'm here in Iceland also. Yeah. Have, yes. So, you are in New York, or? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I am. <laughs> um, the weather has been quite mild, actually. I don't know. How is it in Iceland? Is the winter still still winter? Yeah, it's been a very tough winter, you know, with much storm and uh, icy, icy roads and much snow. But now it's uh, quite mild now. The last week now, 5 to 8 degrees. So it's uh, quite good now. And we are very happy with 5 degrees and not so much storm. <laughs> yeah, New York has been very mild compared yes. to previous uh, years ago. I think last year was already relatively mild, but this year, until now, we didn't really have snow or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quite, quite different in that way, the but weather. the West Coast is horrible, apparently. I think it even snowed in LA, which is very unusual. Okay, so, so is it quite different between East and West? Yes, very different. I mean, there are storms and cold and yeah, I don't know. It's very unusual. Mm. So, well. So when do you start? Uh, we start two? Uh, yeah, we start in five minutes, yes, more yes. or less, or four minutes. So we have mm. a little bit of time. Yes, um, good. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to this discussion mm -hmm. because 
I don't know if you're aware of that many school districts here in the US use this approach from this, I forgot her name, this Australian um, reading scientist like that was, I think, in the 70s or so. She made herself a name and then um, a lot of politicians here in the US supported her, which is kind of this reading method that um, you just expose the kids to books and give them a place to sit and they will learn it without the sounds, without learning the sounds. Yes, I, I know that method. Yeah, oh, it, it ruins oh. a lot of children's life, I think, and still does. Yes, because, you know, we have got visitors here on Thursday, Stanislav Tihan, one of the biggest in this field, you know, from France, College of France, uh, and uh, he has been uh, working on this kind of, uh, from this neuroscience perspective, and he said, if you don't use phonics, the stuff, you know, let the sound knowledge, you not be able to read. Yes. So you be illiterate, literate. Yeah, and a lot of children in the US are. Yes, because we must and we specially, specially with import for the boys. But special important because they need a little bit more support often and to get this focus, get focused and uh, especially important have the research shown also that uh, to use this phonics approach. Or what we use in Westman, we use the letter sound knowledge uh, in the in the start. But uh, and then we find out how many letters or sound they know, and how many of the children are able to read when they start. Because it's a, if you have a group of fifty children here in Iceland, maybe five is able to read. They oh. can read words or sentences when they start school at six. Mm -hmm. So you have five who know no letters not able to read in a, a, at all and they know only one or maybe no letters and they need to have we have found it in norway where we had 29 signs in the alphabet or 29 letters but you need to know 19 plus minus five to be able to break the reading code so that's a very very important to don't jump over these states of the reading process. Yes. And uh, we have had big problems in Iceland, you know, in PISA, that 34% of the boys are not able to read, the, understand the text to read when they have 15. And 19% of the girls, who is quite high also, and uh, we think it starts very early. They start already from the nursery home, but they are not so good. They need more training and more what you call the vocabulary training to know words and uh, what it means. You know, you have horse and your house and you, all kinds of things. They should know what, what is this vocabulary. So we think that they start already in the nursery home, and that 806 in Iceland, that they have not the same vocabulary as the, as the girls. And that is giving us this problem when they come to Pisa. So it's a very, very important to start early with this vocabulary training and to have this language comprehension. Very, very important. So we are also trying to take this our, our focus also in the nursery home now because we need to start there you need to know how many words children know at the age of three and then we start there to train them so uh, yeah that uh, is very interesting because or let me we kind of skip the introduction so let me no. go Go back and introduce you to the audience and then continue with um, with the discussion because I think that's a very interesting point there about the vocabulary 
yes. that, um, that was learned before. But yeah, so <clears throat> welcome everyone to Science Society and of course a special welcome to uh, Professor um, Hermundur uh, Sigmundsen. And um, before we start, um, prof um, he's a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in the Department of Psychology. And I shared on top of the room um, a Google Doc um, that has the links to all the important reading about the subject. And um, the question that we usually ask our guest speakers to get to know them a little bit better is how did you choose to become a scientist in that field? Was it, you know, that did, did something elicit the interest in, in studying this and how children learn and and um, do this, you know, doing this really interesting and important work? Yes, I, uh, when I take my master's degree in 1992, then I got really the interest to take the way forward to, to learn more about, then I was really interested in motivation factors, I was really interested in skill development and learning. And then I decided to take that further in a PhD program. And I started in 95 with my PhD in, in, in Frontem in Norway. And the focus was then on learning and skill development. I was really lucky that I was in a very good group with scientists from, uh, from the UK, John and Brian Hopkins. And uh, John Whiting was my supervisor and he was really good in this kind of neuroscience on, and education and also the kind of skill development and uh, very, very good in experimental psychology. So I started my career more in this experimental studies in always focusing on children, but I started to look more on this, how this um, sensory integration, visual processing, how that is important to, to give, uh, to be able to, to uh, develop motor skills, uh, reading skills, and also mathematics skills. So that was the first five, six years, I was really focusing on what kind of approach this link between perception and cognition. How that, uh, if you have problem with visual processing, that can give problems both in motor skills, to develop, develop motor skills, develop in cognitive skills, and develop in mathematical skills. So that was uh, really interesting. And then I, after that, uh, that years, with that focus, I was really interesting in how do we learn? How do we change these uh, people and changing the or giving the children possibility to develop their skills? Uh, what? How should we do that? You know, because that's a very very important part for for parents to know the nursery home children, the child, uh, the, the the school child, uh, school teachers, and also the trainers. So. I used many, many years to try to understand learning from a neural point of view and was using these theories from Edelman, Gerard Edelman, this neural Darwinism, uh, how this kind of network theories. So trying to, to try his theory in, um, uh, on studies, you know, empirical studies. So use a lot of studies and a lot of time to understand it how much specificity is it in learning? And uh, we ended to say that uh, Edelman's theory supports specificity of learning. So that was the, uh, using a lot of time in, uh, in that, that kind of research. And what we ended up with was an article, what you name, what is train develops. It sounds easy, but it's uh, quite difficult because you should give children right challenges and, uh, and uh, to give right challenges, you must know about the task and you must be expert in this area you are teaching. So it's a very, very important, but at the same time, a little bit difficult for teachers and uh, also parents. So a small introduction. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is really interesting because I think 
especially the part that you consider very strongly also the emotional well-being while the kids acquire their skills and the program you did I, do you want to maybe describe the the everyday program kids go through because it's a very you know everyday ritual type of program you also developed i think that was really yes. interesting yes i can do that because uh, when uh, we have been working on this uh, we uh, I get, I did, did a question. I get, got a question from from ten years ago. It's a little bit, little bit more start about this. And then people ask me, Hermundur, you're talking about you need to train much, and you need specific training to be good. And what kind of people are training so much? I said, oh, good question. So the last ten years, I've been working on this motivational factors, which we call passion for a cement, greed, or it's a strong interest or strong preference a perseverance, excuse me, and this growth mindset. And I, after working with that kind of motives for many years, I had a lot of experience to deal with this kind of what we call alternative school day. What we, we use all these good theories from Edelman, uh, Ericsson, C.C. Uh, uh, Mihaly, taking that together inside school. I said, why not use the most important theories within motivational factors, within learning psychology, together with the importance of physical activity, together with this phonics approach, who's a who's, uh, strongest researcher in the world, like Stanis Tatehane and Heike Litten in, uh, from US Kula, show that is a, you don't you are not able to read without learning left to sound knowledge and break it really good. Therefore, I developed this program for some years ago, what we call Quakeum Next One in Iceland. This is a ignition project because we find out that the most important factor to for, for children to be able to learn and for all of us to be able to learn is to have some kind of ignition. You must be very interested in the area you're going to develop. And then I have this program ready, this kind of total, uh, you know, uh, total different school day. Like in a, we start, we have always before lunch, we have this kind of basic skills who are, uh, like in Icelandic, this is, the, this is uh, reading or Icelandic. This is math and science. We take these three main basic skills before lunch and with physical activity. In the second or third time, we have physical activity for all the children. Uh, so there's a physical activity. If it's not the physical education in the school, who is a two hours per week, and we have also one hour swimming in Iceland schools, then they get two hours extra physical activity who is more with this enjoyment of movement. Then there's all, all never more than 35 to 40 minute, minutes long hours with teaching, always 10 minutes break. Then good lunch for 30 minutes. And after lunch, we have this training hour. And the training hour builds on both Ericsson and Sissi Mihaly, because they say, we need to train specific what you should be good on. Everyone needs the right challenges. And in the first year, the main focus is on the reading skills. And we are using uh, 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 approach was developed in Norway for many, many years ago, who we have taken now, we call it letter sound knowledge test, where the children when they start school at age or six, we take this test, it takes six to ten minutes for each children, then we know how many letters and their sound they know, large letters and small letters. We know if they are able to read words, are they able to read sentences, or are they able to read short text. But all this information get when they start school. So Ole and Johan, who was not able to 
Reading they know maybe one or two letter on their sounds. They need specific training on the letters sound knowledge. On the other end, you can maybe get two, two, two children who are able to read. They read sentences. They are able to read sent, uh, uh, small text. And then that group get the possibility to choose their own book to read. That is a very, very important from Sister Mihaly's research that to able to see yourself what you're doing is very, very important for your motivation. So we have that kind of very, very good this training hour for giving every children right challenges. And in West Monoyer, we have three groups with around 16, 70 children. In the training hour, we get one extra teacher in to cult to help them to give everyone right challenges. And then they work on that for 40 minutes and then we take pause. Then the last hour of the day to get them more uh, you know uh, you know no positive feeling of the school. We have this passion hour. The children come to school around 8:30, then they can choose from five different topics like music, painting, uh, making food, uh, they have this kind of uh, carpenter where you are building something and we have five different things they can choose about. And they are looking forward to this passion hour every to, uh, through the whole the school day. So the passion hour is very, very good in this, uh, in this, in this, uh, pro, in this uh, process that they are able to choose early what they want to do. And now we are, because there's also a research and development project, now we are thinking how we can expand this kind of uh, passion hour. So we are, uh, we are also thinking about that with the, with the rectors, with the headmaster, to find out how can we do that in a good way. Because I want also that they who want to learn instrument, like playing guitar or drums, they can get that from the age of six or seven. So you can, when you're 12 years, you can play drums or play guitar, for example. So we are thinking how it's possible to do that in more that they are more able to learn, for example, specific instruments or painting that they can choose more uh, uh, that kind of skills they really like. Now it's, a, now it's going well because we are finished with, uh, we are in the second year, it's going very well with this project. And, uh, we uh, have, and what we think is very important that the, both the headmaster, the teacher for the children, the parents of the children, and the children themselves are saying it's a very, very nice. They are, uh, they are, uh, they are very happy about the, about the, how they are feeling. They are, uh, we get it more this kind of mastery feeling and this feeling of I can was a very, very important. We think that we start the school in a good manner and we are able to give every children his right challenges. Then you know that they will get the common to flow and they get this positive, uh, positive feeling of that they are able to do things. This I can mentality, who we think is a very, very important. So that was some small, <laughs> Uh, presentation of the of the project. Yeah, the the that is I think also really important uh, factor. You know, all these important factors you told us about are really interesting, and I wish that every school would adapt to that. I don't know if you know about schools here in the US, there's very little recess, uh, starting, uh, I think, around 20 minutes a day only, the kids get recess, and then they get some lunch time. So and I've always criticized that very much um, in the school system. And the the part that the kids can choose their passion and also choose the topics they would like to read about. I think it's really important and not like an from that young age an imposed type of topic they have to uh, read from 
um, are so important um, factors. Did you also assess then um, the emotional well-being of the children? Because, you know, a lot of children, as you also uh, mentioned in your work, have ADHD uh, problems. Um, did that improve um, when you switch to having more uh, physical activity and then also um, having this, you know, passion hour? Did the attention improve? Did the emotional well-being of the children improve? Over yes, time? Because we, we, we know that uh, this, uh, this attention span to the children who have, for example, ADHD is a very important not to have too long hours. We have a short time. So we are also thinking now to have possible for example, uh, taking this physical activity 30 minutes be, you know, we have always this break 10 minutes before be, between this 35, 40 minutes lecture, we have 10 minutes break where they can go out or in the, in the corridor or whatever. And then we have this third, uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes physical activity. Now we're thinking maybe to break that up in two, uh, 30 minutes uh, before lunch and 30 minutes after lunch. And we see that shorter lecture, more recess, is kind of training hour where everyone works with what they, what they, where they stand, is giving much more concentration, much more focus. And then of course we have in this group of 50, we have three, four who have some kind of learning difficulties we, we didn't know about when they come from nursery home. So they are getting at once when they come in and we are maybe trying to teach them to read, they get a special teacher at once. We know this five, there was a five children for the first year who needed special teacher, special help. So she has helped them from the start to create a good atmosphere. They can work together. They can work with this letter sound knowledge and, and try to focus on that. And we was really, really happy about that, that uh, how that functioning, that we start so early with this intervention for the people or for the children who really need it. Uh, so the big goal is to increase well-being increase results and increase this kind of motivation. That is the three main goal of this project. And after this training hour is functioning very well and also this passion because it's a very strange with this with the children who have maybe those kind of attention problem, they are very good when they get to work on the things they like. Then they get more dopamine and we see that they are much more focusing and concentrated when they can choose themselves. So we think it's a fantastic for that group also. And I was talking to the, to the special teacher now last week, and he told me, Hermundur, this two, because we are also some foreigners who come from Poland, because there are a lot of fishery in, in Westmanair, so people come to work in the fish, fish fabrics, and then the children don't know Icelandic and don't know English. And she said to me, Hermit, this project, this, this kind of how we are working, is perfect also for the people who come from abroad. Because they start very, very easy with these basic things. At, when we're learning them the letter sound, they learn also that I, as, you know, I, C, E is ice, ice. And what is ice, you know? And then we show them a picture of it. This means house, these three letters. It's a how, who, who is, or an Icelandic, and then they know this is a house. So at the same time, they're learning them the language of what words mean, you're learning them letter sounds. So it's functioning very well with this group of children also. We have also experience from some years ago, where we're helping Oslo community, who is 800,000 people living in Oslo, to create better teaching for the people who come from abroad, from all the countries how we should work with them. You know, you take to integrate this language development with letter sound knowledge and to learn to read. So I, I think we think it's a very, very good kind of uh, uh, pro, uh, 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 project to help that group also. 
Yeah, I think yeah. that is very important in many countries because, you know, PISA studies have shown that in many countries, children that come from a home where they have spoken a different language that uh, they they don't acquire the skills necessary to succeed then later on in school. So I think that is a very important part of your approach. And um, a ro Roland asked a question. Um, would you agree that the current educative system I, I assume in in the US, but correct me if I'm wrong, Roland, um, is not built around the outcome for children, but rather the cost model of the school and, uh, oh, globally. And where would you strike the balance? That's a very good question. Uh, very good question for me, Katarina. Uh, this is always this discussion that we, that we, we say in our process, Set, let, school, set the children in focus. That is our main goal. We must go back to put the children in focus. And they build up a system around the children, not build up a system where the children should fit into. Therefore, I think also we get a lot more of this ADD problematic. We get more children who don't like the schools. There's a big problem in Iceland now also that children don't want to go to schools. You know, they're at home. Uh, so, so we need to build the system around the children. I think that is the main key message for me in that sense, because I work in this area for 27 years. And that is the most important. That we are trying to undertake this kind of motivation factor. We know also this kind of physical activity is very good for children to get some break, you know, get some relax to talk together and uh, and then also this kind of this more uh, focus on where you stand that give you more this kind of se better self-esteem that you're able to do things, uh, you're able to, to make process. Uh, uh, so we think it's a very, very important and also think about more sh uh, shoes. Like for example, this, this was a tutor new in Iceland, they could shoes books. Not the teachers say take this book and read it home. No, they can shoes book themselves. That was a totally new, uh, you know, that children can choose self from, you know, when they have the, set the books in different levels. This is a level one, who are just started, what you call red level. This is yellow level, and this is a green level. So you can choose from the, from this, uh, from this uh, box, who, from uh, box red. And then they said they can choose the books they want to take home. So taking more approach toward the children's needs, I think is very, very important for the school system. And we did also measure this kind of well-being and uh, how you perceive competence. And we see uh, from the first year now, we had had through this process from the first year last year, because we take base time before we started. And this is a significant difference between the children in our project in first grade and the children in the, who was the first grade the year before. How they like school, how they like the different topics. So we did take the baseline, we just the paper on that now, where we are measuring well-being and perceived competence, where the children answer themselves. We use this MOIS with the five faces, from a very happy face, little bit more happy, neutral, and a little bit more angry face. And the children say, how do you like math? How are going with math? How, how are you going in math? And they are able to see that we have a high correlation, of course, can you say, between well-being and perceived competence. So that paper is just coming out. I think it's one of the five I sent you. That is, uh, that is very interesting that it also applies for math. And um, I think, um, yeah, that, that's really an outstanding, you know, very important topic to also discuss. But Roland came on stage. Hi, Roland. Did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Katarina. Hello, Hermundur. Uh, I hope I've pronounced your name right. 
Yes, yes. Very, uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to... Uh, I totally understand the answer you gave about focusing the education around the children. But if you want to transition from the existing model to the model that you're suggesting, the question that I would ask is, where does where does this transition start taking place? And how do you remove the focus from the cost model or the teacher training model to the outcome for the children? That's a very good question, Roland, also. But, uh, so what we did in Westmoneer, we used it some time to, 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 to let the basis for the process. We was talking to teachers, we talked to the headmasters, we was creating this kind of atmosphere for this kind of approach, why we are thinking about this importance of having some measurement to you can see where the children are to give them the right, right uh, challenges. We talked to the education ministry to see if our approach to need any changes from the from the program who is giving it all schools. We did not need that because they have this flexibility within the model. So only things that we should count on the hour or time in different topics. And we was in, in that and with this set also, I think it's very important that we we started with the first grade. And then we take the first and second grade. And now we are we are just finished uh, we are we are we are we are nearly finished with the second year now. And then the next year we have first, second or third year. We start slowly with changing. And what we find out it it doesn't cost them any more than earlier. And I think also this project, this kind of approach, are giving also lower cost to special education because they find now that getting the special pedagogies in straight away when they start the school to help them like with that important topics like reading is very, very important. We were very happy about the outcome where all these 50 children in the project was able to read words after the first year. So he was really happy about it. Also these three, four who come from abroad, two, three also had some learning problems. All was able to read simple words or break in the reading code. So that, that we, we saw the success in that rate and we have a student from Norway who was doing the little bit similar kind of uh, measurement in September, January, May, and they find out 72% was able to read words after the first year. And we was in 100% the first year. And now our goal now is that 80 to 90% will be able to read, read text after the second grade. And I think that of course, it's important with its cost model for the, I think, the communities. But I think it will, it will, when we are taking this into school, we will get less cost in special pedagogy. I'm sure about that. Was that some answer, Roland? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much, Hermundur, for that. Uh, one, if I can carry on with just two more very quick questions. Uh, did, did you see more engagement from the children in, 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 in terms of interest in learning? And the second part of that question is, how has it affected the, the teacher training model? Yes, it's a very good question, Roland, about the children. We see much more engagement, especially in these training hours, where they get the right challenges, was working with, 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 uh, with uh, all... Uh, almost every children was working with different kind of different kind of challenges, and we saw they gave them this extra feeling of yes, I am able to do this. So what what we say, I can feeling, and we also I heard from the assistant teacher who had master uh, for some yes, uh, for some weeks ago, and because we have three groups in Westmoreland who are maybe they are together the 16, 17 children each group. But this passion hour, when they can choose different topics across the groups, was giving 
more interaction between the different children from different groups who have not been there earlier. So that was very interesting also. Maybe this is also important for social development, that you are able to talk with more, more children and, and create this, uh, this stronger kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, feeling of uh, social relations. Uh, we think also, we are working together with the educational faculty here in Iceland, in the uh, University of Iceland, and we are now trying to, uh, to, to develop the, a course for the university who will take this important theories we are using to build this project together with experience from the project and this, this kind of resource we have now from research. Not everything is possible to do a research on, but we are trying to do as much as we can to be able to understand this process. And the, also very important what we think also this kind of how do the teachers like this model. They think that uh, they can relax more, it's not the same stress as earlier, and they, they feel that they are more happy, and the same we can say for the children. Did they give you some answer, Roland? Uh, thank you very much, Hermundur. Uh, thank you, Katarina. I'll move myself back to the audience. Great stuff. Uh, great listening to you both. Thank yeah, you. thank you for those great questions. Um, those were really interesting. Um, it's really interesting that you're taking now these um, learning approaches or teaching approaches uh, to higher education. I'm also wondering, you know, when the kids get into this preteen, teen age, a lot of children kind of drop um, an interest in school and in different uh, subjects and then also you know and paying attention in school due to you know being teenagers and and um and like peer pressure and so on did you think of moving also uh this approach into that age category let's say from 12 to 16 or so and 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 would you change Anything about that age group? I don't know if you have thought about it, but I thought that would be pretty interesting. Yes, we have thought about it. And our aim is now to follow up the children in Westmanayar for 10 years. And everyone, we now we, uh, the first who started in our second grade, and we, we take the first and second, and then next year, first, second, third. So our aim is to try to involve this motor with more this basic skills before lunch, physical activity for lunch, and maybe also after lunch, this kind of training hour, then they can maybe not be reading as the first year, and now we have the second year reading and math and science, and then we can have this passion hour, because we have a little bit longer school day when they're older, then we can take maybe uh, social, uh, social areas, uh, uh, you know, science about the social system and these kinds of things. And then we have always this passion over, or they, where they can choose themselves. And we are now thinking with the, with the school head, school leadership, how are we able to do this when you're older? Uh, what kind of subject, subject can they choose from? Because we think that is a very, very important for the for the, how they like schools to have this kind of, they can choose it in the end. They end the school in some positive things they like to do. And I would like to go more uh, towards also this kind of skills like carpenter, you know, uh, this kind of, uh, what do you call this in English, this kind of uh, where you can work with electricity, you can work with the hair of people, you know, uh, uh, we can go a little bit more towards that also in this uh, in this passion hour. So we give them like we give them the more possibility. So and then they can maybe after also a while they can maybe choose also. We are also thinking that maybe when you are over the fifth or sixth grade, you can maybe choose two topics you will focus on. Like if I like really to play guitar, I will get the chance to play guitar two times a week in the school or three times a week, you know, or you, you choose guitar and maybe painting. 
then it could take two shippers forward. We think it will give this more this kind of autotelic experience that you feeling I am able to choose myself and what will give better well-being. And I'm clearly, we're also working on that in the high school in Norway now, and here in Iceland, to try to get more, even more, ship that they can choose about, you know, not, uh, and, and try to find, find, find out what should be in the base, what should be the basic in the, also the high school, and try to think about what, how are we able to give the students as much possibility of choosing their topics, also in the high school, you know. So as a, we, we, are, we are really thinking about this and we have a group of people here really working on this, both here in Norway and Iceland. And I have been giving uh, now the last 10 years master degree with this uh, focus on theories and uh, uh, very, very important theories for development, learning, motivation factors and uh, reading and basic skills development. So we have a lot of students now coming out to take in PhD now with this knowledge. So we think it's a very, very important as uh, Roland or Roland Institute to create this also into university, what we are doing. We can give our lectures about this. We can give a course about this kind of important theories for development and learning. I think that's, that's really important. And um, I'm sorry, my dog is working. The, the I don't know, but in a lot of countries we have, at least, you know, in Germany and so on, I don't know how it is in Norway, but we have a shortage of uh, skilled, um, skilled people to do all kinds of jobs right now, um, and especially hands-on jobs, like you said, carpenter, you know, build the electricians, mm -hmm. build things around the house. And um, I think that since school has been so theoretical that people didn't even get the chance to develop the passion for these sorts of hands-on uh, skills anymore. Uh, do, you, do you think that this was, this is, you know, a factor that led to this problem and, and, and um, would you think that that's why it's very urgent for those countries to adapt this type of um, teaching um, program? Yes, I think so. And uh, if we are taking these theories really seriously, like Sissimiadis work about flow and well-being and achievement, of course we should give children and adults and more shoes of topics and also because it's very very important if you are thinking about for example science how important science is in our our society today to give children good science background and education early so you can also know about why it's important you know to 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 behave in the for example in the in the nature, at the same time, we should give them this possibility of early experience in carpenting, uh, creating, you know, fixing some motors of cars or, or fixing some electricity or fixing some hair of people or, you know, what, what they, or some design, for example. Of course, we should introduce that early, as we say in our our theory of passion is to find your passion and develop it. And I think it's a very, very important point when we find out who people who are excellent in areas, like when we work on our book project, was uh, was we name was expertise. But I talked to 23 experts. I saw in Darwin, uh, in history, uh, Darwin's history and Horst Jantesen's history, you know, the famous Danish uh, writer. But the passion for achievement was the most important factor for their well-being and achievement. So we think we should create this kind of passion early, this possibility to find out which area do you like, where do you want to, which area do you want to try out and be better in. 
not start maybe with uh, with these things when you are maybe 15, 16, you know, you never, uh, you don't know what for some electricity is or what, what you can, can fix something there, you know what I mean, or design, you know. So start early with these kind of things. So you can maybe have an experience with maybe 20 things from school. And you say, this too I want to focus on. You know what I mean? So I think it's a very, very important, as you take Katrina, to take it also forward uh, for, uh, in the, when you're getting older. Yes, I agree. And also, you know, our life is becoming longer, you know, in, in developed countries. And um, the time we will be working because like the education time takes longer, but also the time we'll be working uh, will be extended because, um, you know, hopefully continues that we are healthier at a high age. So maybe we won't stay in one type of area of work our whole lives in the future. Uh, and to be exposed to different experiences early on would give people the confidence to switch more easily with the ever-changing world. Um, so people would be more confident, let's say, if a factory closes to transition to a new skill, if the experience early on in life um, around learning was very positive uh, in general and not just um, on one specific subject and the rest was you know painful and and, and full of fear um do, do you think that this will become more and more important yes i uh, totally agree with you katina that will be very very important in the future to give us uh, the more possible of course we should take this basic skill like able to read with the best method best kind of uh, approach you should learn the basic in also the, the, the maths and also learning the science, how important that is for our, our, our lives. At the same time, we should give we're a much more flexibility and try to get this more of this kind of, uh, uh, try to develop this approach in children and try to early to find out what do I want to learn about it. Like, like also we are doing this now also in West Manor with this kind of, now in the second year, when you try to write something, you know, now you should draw your picture and you should write a story about the picture. Now that's for the children who come a little bit longer. And that is, they, they, they really like it, especially the boys also are all in where they can, where they can, uh, where they can uh, paint their pictures and then wrote, wrote about the picture. They can decide self what they want to write about. And that is the same that you can say, okay, here we have 10 different topics what do you want to work on now the next two weeks and and, and you know i think we create very different kind of uh, uh, attitude also in the in the group of uh, of uh, school children if we're able to do this that's not at least my because we know how important passionate we also know that the people who are very very good at some things they have started early to think about it you know, like Jose Anderson, he was started as an eight or five, six to create some kind of theater, uh, what he played for her, her his uh, grandmother. You know, creating self, you know, some kind of passions and uh, activity for the person in a theater, you know, where he played alone. <laughs> Same with Darwin, you know, he don't like to be in the school, so father was very worried about Darwin, but he was really interesting in nature fishing with a you know fishing fish uh, fishing some uh, you know and he not only fish the fish he also paint the fish and know exactly how it looks like and what the name was so at least two great persons in this area have started very early you know also from iceland our björk you know the singer she started five years old to sing you know I mean, <laughs> so so we know it is often how are you able to come in and create this thing because I think everyone has some area they are interested in and want to, to, to uh, like to create and be better in. So I find that area I'm, I'm a really interested in that they are 
able to do early. Like yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, that's interesting that you, that you mentioned it's very important to find, you know, to give the opportunity for uh, people to find their, their passions early on. Um, do you, mm, so because it, it becomes then part also of their identity, but, um, do you think that that learning this, you know, about the passion and that you can, you know, you can excel if you, if you find this passion, are are people that that found this also more positive about learning and and about life basically if something or more resilient if if a trauma happens or something, is there? Do you find that that people that find these type of passions are more um, resilient if some something bad happens in their life so we, we we know that this kind of this passion for a cement what we are working on have a high correlation with flow for example and we know flow is a very important factor for for well-being and uh, and be able to come uh, into this kind of area you really like, you forget time and place, you know, because you're so interested in that. So I think this is a very, we know also that uh, meaning in life is important for these factors. These factors are very high correlation with meaning in life, with the kind of well-being. So, and also growth mindset, where we are also working very strongly in that growth mindset should, should create or be a basis for all the milieu we're working that you, you believe that everyone can develop if he, if, he, if he work systematically towards that and are given the possibility of working in that area with good mentor. We found also in our research that mentor, good mentor, good teacher, good trainer is very, very important for all the people who will be good in something. Everyone has had some mentor on the on, on their way, who can help them, support them. And so I think it's a very important that we can always go back to this area we are good in, and that we give us a better feeling or at least place where you can go in. Like, you know, I play instrument, I play uh, drums and bass and I can sing. So I really like to go into that, you know, that give a very good feeling of, of, uh, of uh, of uh, you know this kind of strong in your selfish team because you are quite good in this and we i know also that physical activity is very important we wrote a paper about important emotion relation and passion for the gray and white matter who is the basic brain system but and it's also very important for well-being we know also nature is important for these factors so i think it's a we can find this kind of this to find this area to have this kind of always is possible that you want to be better you can create you can develop it's a very very good approach to have together of course with this relation factors and emotion factors i'm really busy in that to try to say to everyone in every age passion relation and motion is a key activities you should have whole their life, both the newborn children and the older people. What I'm also giving lecture for older people, you know, it's a very nice to have that groups, you know, it's 80, around 80 years old, and they are finding out, you know, then they're finding out not stop to have area you are passionate for. Keep on in your area, you know, <laughs> and what kind of motion can you do now? Are we thinking about them? You know, what can you do to keep you some kind of active? So it's a it's a very very interesting that all these theories we built on, and also this kind of this kind of uh, this kind of uh, approach can be hold the life. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that uh, that does. Um... Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, I, I think I observed it, but it's just 
you know a lot of data what I observe in the life so um, but that you confirm that that is really interesting with your research and then Roland ask another question is asking another question in a world where communication critical thinking and collaboration skills are becoming more important is is your program program favoring these type of skills too yes i think that uh, you know in in our program there is no telephones all love you know in the in the school we are doing now you know that you should keep your telephone you know in a box or or have it at home you know so we are trying to get this kind of better the social relation and it is also very important to get all from all the social media and this kind of thing you get some some space from it in the schools and, and like when i am training or playing music i never have the telephone around me so that's important but at the same time we know that to be able to read to be able to write a text or say something with your you know with, from your thinking like this more of this speech related is cornerstone in life and if you are also feeling better you know you are you are you are feeling that you are able to do something there are some areas you like to do and you maybe be better in that area you know you have better self-esteem and i think that is also a very important factor for to have a better life you know what i mean and to be better in communicate with different groups so I think this is a very linked together, you know, both that you have a feeling better, you are, you are developing better communicate skills via the language, you are better the vocabulary, and uh, that in a sense we give you better possibility to, to react in a society. I think so. That your, yeah. yeah. your selfish team uh, will give you better possibilities and also this courage that you're as i say if i was after working with system Halis theory for from 89 i had some lectures some days about this and i say the k wars if i take system Halis research is never stop taking silences that is a k message to also having a good life i think yeah, I agree. I think that we could solve probably a lot of conflicts in society by having children that grow up with confidence and a positive mindset and positive experiences, especially in schools. And I think if kids are more focused on, for example, their passion project, they would think less about bullying other children um, um, that, you know, and those type of experiences from being bullied in school will lead them to, you know, negative outcome later on and in and, and social connections. So I, mm. think, I think that's, I think the passion part of your program is, is so interesting it's so important to keep the attention i mean i have that myself and my children too we have slight adhd uh mm. you know but if we are interested in in something we can sit there for hours and hours and you know not mm. being not being distracted yes, yes. as long mm. as we are interested and when my son can can do music for hours and hours and hours but then other things it's very yeah. hard to be focusing on so i think that part is very important that the kids look forward to it towards mm. the end and, and that that is, it's a very good <laughs> point you have katarina i will say you that uh, in, in in west monday that was a uh, you know i was in school outside in the countryside in in, in iceland with maybe 20 children in the in the class from uh, seven to 12 years and i always remember how happy i was on fridays when i was finished with schools because the schools ends 
that we have we song together these 20 children with some from some song book they come guy from the farmer from the from the maybe living 10 kilometers from the school who come with this uh, with an play instrument and we were singing and then always dancing the last 35 minutes 40 minutes was dancing so ah, now we go home so everyone was smiling and very happy after this and so in westman here we decided the school on friday should end on singing and dancing so that is also i am very and i am creating now process with this dancing from zero to yeah, 1890. i think dancing is a very very nice uh, listen to music dancing is a very very interesting kind of motion activity where you have motion and also this relation factors uh, who we are now trying to uh, build on and try to do some better or more uh, more experiment about so in Westmanner we end the day school day on Fridays on dancing and singing so <laughs> I don't say that that's a and that everyone seems to like that that's very very strange that everyone likes to sing and uh, and dance together in of course different kind of music but when i was young but uh, now and but uh, they like to dance <laughs> so yeah I, I that sounds wonderful um i agree i think i think it's a very origin of how we maybe communicate that i read about the evolution of um of communication papers at some point and how language developed and there was the theory that first we develop music to kind of bring ourselves to kind of a similar emotional state uh, so i think it's also the sounds that make us sad or make us happy um across cultures might um be be similar um you know like fast-paced music slow and so on so yeah. i think it's a very yeah it, it plays to our very origins of communication probably so yes because i i think that also when i was working on this paper about motion relation passion that uh, it's so important these factors for the whole life and for children in school we should always have these factors with us, you know, motion, some kind of motion, you know, getting positive the motion, building up this relation through the language that took maybe activity we can do together. And then the always this passion, learning new things, taking challenges, you know, and then you need to have some kind of, you know, challenges you like to do, you know, really like to do this instead of this. And then you have these three elements who are very, very important for our functioning. That is not my, my key, and I'm trying to link this to all what we are doing now, these three elements of our approach who are also lifespan. You know, we're not only looking on children in school, but we're also looking on, for example, baby swimming. Why is that important? That children in baby swimming from three to eight months, what are that doing for the children and their, and their parents, for example? Is it giving, of course, some motion, some relation with the parents, of course. They are singing together with the baby swimming. And the same, I'm working with the 80 years old. What should, can they do? You, they can have some motion together. They can play card together or singing together, for example, to have the relation. And they try, try to learn new things or not stop doing things they like to do. Because that's always this problem that the more passion goes a little bit down with increasing age. At the same time, also growth mindset. But the perseverance is possible to keep on. So you can have the perseverance to stay in things if you like the things. Do you know what I mean, Katrina? That's what I'm really now trying to, trying to understand better, this kind of variables. Yeah, and it's very important. So um, I, I, I was wondering if you have time for a question from two more people, um, if that's okay with you. Yes, yes, that's okay. Yes? Perfect. So Rebecca and Jacob, please go ahead. 
Hi, <clears throat> I, I, I think I originally had a different question, but Katarina, after you brought up, I, I, I now have a, is it true that sounds across different cultures create the same emotion in people? I'm not sure about that. I've not read that. Uh, I, I've not do any research myself, but I, I have, I have experienced different kind of uh, how music. Uh, I, you know, I've been in uh, big conferences where they have some kind of musical uh, experience in that uh, conferences, and uh, this is amazing to see how it get different people to uh, be active in that kind of experiences. So I have that, but it's a very, very good question. Do they but move that, in the same way when you go to the conferences and you hear the music? Do people move in the same way to the same music, even though they're, the people are from different places this, in the world? You know, I could tell you more about it. I was in conference in Edinburgh with David Lee, one of the biggest names in the experimental psychology. And the, in the, in, they had some kind of you know uh, dinner, and then after dinner, or five drummers playing on uh, African drummers. And after five to 10 minutes, everyone from the conference, 150 people was coming on the dance floor yeah. with this drumming activity, you know, drumming rhythm. That was amazing, but everyone, uh, or the people I saw was dancing differently, but all can try to follow that rhythm. So for me, it was, wow, this is something with the dance. I had also some experience with, uh, with a workshop with the older people. I was two days with them. It was from 70 to 85 here in Iceland. And they want to have a disco in the evening. And I think everyone of these people was on the floor, you know, from 8 to 10 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so yeah. there is something with music who is able to both the music and the dancing is doing something with us as a humans. Maybe some kind of old, uh, from the evolution part, I, I don't know. <laughs> but this is something. <laughs> okay, because I'm, I, oh, I have so many uh, thoughts about this, but um, it, the idea of passion is really fascinating. And I'm wondering if when we are pursuing our passion, if we have a greater intake or a certain intake of in-breath, of, of, of breathing, not necessarily in-breath, of breathing. And if that correlates with learning and, and then dancing, music, I'm trying to think this through. I, I think that's a, a longer, I have to think that one through. But yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. That's, 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 Breath. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. It's a new new research field for me. So <laughs> that's a very good question. I, uh, something to try to answer later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a, it's a very interesting topic. And I love that you're focusing on passion because so many people are in jobs that they don't like, right? And that's and, often and, challenges. So, what? Mm, there's often challenges that people don't maybe like their job. So it's a try to get, you know, if you get some kind of task you maybe like, that would be very, very nice for people, I think, <laughs> in right, that right. form. And I, I think where the correlate is, is that, is that I, I wonder if we're all ex experiencing vibrational experiences, um, because I think everything vibrates. And so the, if we are doing something that we like, we probably have a vibrational experience that the people around us also experience to some extent because of their inter interoceptive system, the way they experience their body. It's a sensory system with the way they experience their bodies inside, the way they experience themselves. And so I will. Yeah, that's a very interesting. What do you mean? Some sort of cut off this interaction. We will, you can, you will give some kind of uh, signal that uh, in this interaction process, you mean? It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yes. And I we all have interoceptive systems, right? We all, yeah, we yeah. all have them, but some of us are, some people are, are more in tune with what's happening in their interoceptive system. Mm. Some people are yeah. not, but we all have it. Mm. That's mm. A very, very interesting because I have a colleague who's really focused on that or shit, you know, more the infant relation, try to understand that better. You know, it's, a, nope. it's, a, it's the same here, but talking about this kind of interaction. 
and he's looking for mother and you know young children younger than i think 10 months to see that interaction you know between them how that interest mother is a little bit you know not feeling well or a little bit sad that interact the children have effect on the children so he's trying to looking at that and that clearly that kind of interaction the interaction yeah yeah yes, I mean, yes, it yes. might be, it might be... I mean that's that's where you come up with the word empathy and and, and yes, so. yes. Thank you right. for this good question. I am not able to answer maybe in a good way because that's not I've not been really looking at that, but this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm <clears throat> I'm just so thankful for you know scientists and researchers who are are doing the work and connecting the dots together because there's so many there's so much complexity and so many dots to connect. Yes. Yes. We are trying to answer the small, uh, taking the small steps, you know, we don't answer all of them, but we are taking the small steps to try to understand how something is linked together. I think it's uh, important to take the small steps, I think, at least. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Jacob, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, nice to see you, Katarina. Thank you for having me up. Uh, Mr. Herminder Sigmundson. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Jacob. Um, I'm. I have like this vague um, wondering about the universality of behavior, and it's interesting to me how, kind of across the board of uh, culture and geographic region, we kind of see like humans smile when they feel good, and this idea of um, music and dancing. It's like I imagine, like, when I get food sometimes, I, I sometimes uh, I do a little happy dance. And, <laughs> and, and I've seen this with other people. And it's interesting, like, I'm, I'm trying to bridge my understanding of, like, nurtured cultivation. Like, let's say that we engaged in these um, kind of expressions of positivity. What if we, what if we just integrated them into our lives more. But then I think of this idea of somebody being forced to dance and maybe they wouldn't like that. But um, I don't know. Like I, I imagine the expression of kind of singing and dancing, if people were to do it more, I feel like it has health benefits, um, not only physically, but uh, emotionally, cognitively. And yeah, I just wonder if what would it look like if we were just to kind of try to cultivate more positivity? Because I feel like that's what we do on a daily basis anyway. We use our framework to kind of add more good, what we perceive of as good to our lives. And then the bad stuff, we try to reframe it or solve or fix or change it in somehow, in some way. And, and because we observe these kind of universal expressions of positivity, I just, I wonder what, what it would look like if we tried to, I don't know, like start at the end point and just try to cultivate what we understand as positive. But then again, yeah. how would that even look like? So anyway, it's just like a yeah. vague thought that I had. Yes, I think it's a very good thought you have, uh, Jacob. And uh, I would really like to maybe try to take some of the thoughts forward with you uh, and Katrina if they, and people uh, are in, in your uh, department, if someone wants to be on this process with us, because I'm working now with a Danish women who are expert in dancing and working with dancing and the demands problematic for many years also dancing and people with some kind of uh, physical handicap uh, down syndrome and she's she's toward telling me that there's a very very interesting to see how dance is one way no one is uh, is uh, most dance but uh, they're given the possibility of dance and singing you know we hear in music and, and very many of these uh, groups she talk about uh, really like that kind of kind of settings and i have a lot of experience both with children uh, with baby swimming from three to eight months and also with different age group in schools and also older people how how dance is one way of activity was very positive for many of them so i and i know also when i'm people go to some concert or where they like, the, you know, they go to concert because they like the band who are playing that. It's a really good atoms. You really 
lag jú veli happy when you are there you are happy afterwards when you talk about this you know I have been a good bands you know here uh, around in Iceland and in, in, in Europe and I'm thinking often about it I'd be happy when I think about this concert experience I was on so it's giving me a very good uh, thoughts in the everyday life I'm trying to find some new concert to go on because that's a very this is something with music and dance I, I really like to therefore we are having that in our process that it's something there we like to see more about and maybe look more on the developing factor with dance and that we are uh, trying to do in our positive psychology approach. So very good question from both Rebecca and Jakob. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much um, for those questions and um, the the dancing part uh, is really wonderful um, because you know, I think a lot of people, uh, shame plays a big, a big, represents a big hurdle for a lot of people uh, to be ashamed to do certain, certain things because they think they're not good at it or there has to be a certain way or, or look a certain way to do specific things. Right. So I think addressing shame in a way to just have it in everyday life and in school since always would probably also address that the shame factor um, if it's just something normal we do and uh, we have I don't know if you still have some time <laughs> because Anna and Peter just joined us here so please let me know when when you have to go and then I'll tell people that it's too late for yeah. questions. <laughs> I have maybe some minutes. Maybe I, I must go around 20 over. 20 past. Okay, so we have eight more minutes. Okay, Anna, yeah. uh, please go ahead with your question. I actually don't have a question. How about that? Uh, but I came up on stage because a um, Hermann Dodd, uh, I, I was really intrigued by your accent, but then you actually responded to that. Yeah, I assume you're Icelandic and not Norwegian, even though you're Norway. And I was going to just comment on that, that uh, maybe music is the true universal, um, in my experience uh, around the world, whereas smiles actually are not. However, the smile, I don't know, Hermann Dodd, um, I, I know that the neurons, like when we smile, it sends uh, signals uh, to our brain, uh, so the brain chemistry. However, smiles, like uh, I have personally lived in Japan and uh, many, many research uh, topics have been surrounding the culture notion of smiles and that Japanese people find, uh, like particularly maybe Americans, uh, to over smile. However, I just find everything uh, you seem to be researching, that's my main drive in my own life um, as, a, as an explorer around this world. Uh, because human cognition, human motivation versus discipline, passion, how we tend to learn, uh, as I seem, you know, I always seem to be interested in learning myself as well as teaching uh, about the world. I see myself as a cultural enzyme. So I just wanted, I was just uh, honored to be in your room, Hermundur. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, that was a nice, really interesting share, especially about the Japanese culture. And uh, Peter, uh, welcome to the stage. Do, do you have a last question? Yeah, I had some thoughts about what you said about a, a number of things. I have I missed some parts, but uh, I, I looked over some of the articles and so forth. The um, Thing that was said about shame to comment on that it's one of the problems with school as far as i see it is that you're not taught that being curious and asking questions so you understand what someone means with something is fundamental for learning because school sadly seems to promote memorization and parroting and that's not real learning as far as I see it. So that, that was the thought on that, because if you change how people are looking at things, 
and that doesn't matter if it's kids or grown-ups, then their willingness to do things can change dramatically. And so that 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 was the thought there, and and that links into what I what I kind of posted in the group chat mm -hmm. that motivation is closely connected with well-grounded hope. Hope as strategy is is almost guaranteeing suffering. And and what I mean by that is that if someone sees a path forward, it then that a path forward that may lead to success, then they are much more motivated to, to actually do something. The sad thing is that most people are not seeing that. So I, I was a little bit like, would that align with uh, what research you have done and what your thinking is? And if I'm wrong, then please tell me and point out what, what I've missed. It's a very, very good question, Peter. And uh, that's exactly what we are trying to do now, both in high school in Norway. I have one PhD student who are going to work towards high schools and also in a university. Because in Norway, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, resources going into the how to create more entrepreneurial skills and mindset, mindset in university students. Uh, we are also taking that approach uh, to high school that uh, not only like not only thinking that there's some kind of selection of people who can come up with good ideas or things you as a as a person but we must create this kind of uh, uh, atmosphere and this kind of motivational factors that you are able to do it you can also come with this kind of ideas if you really uh, work toward this, as you say, Peter. And uh, therefore, I have in this, my motel, last articles, I have this I can uh, thinking. We should try to create that kind of feeling for every children and adolescent in schools, not only in the university, but also in high schools and the primary schools. But you can get the feelings and not be shame of coming off with some ideas or ask some difficult question, because that is the way forward. So that kind of, to, to, to get this back to the children, this focus on adults and how they can develop in a better way. And the system must come, seems toward that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have, have you, you've probably come across self-determination theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what I see as a problem with that, is that, um, by the way, I'm Swedish originally, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm close to Norway and I'm fairly familiar, even though I live in the UK right now. The mm -hmm. thing with self-determination theory is that autonomy, competence and rela relatedness is backwards looking. It's, I think that it's, it's true what they have come to that people that have those things uh, feel like they have meaning in life. However, it doesn't give a rest. The reason why it's not more spread the way I see it is that it's not forward looking. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not giving a recipe for what you can do. And that is a thing that I've looked at. And I, I you, you said you were needed to leave 20 past. So, so I, I cannot go into that. But that is, if you're interested in getting in touch, I can map out that because there, there are ways of, uh, turning it around so you can so you can actively do things and that is a thing that i've worked with for a very long time mm -hmm. and uh, so so yeah no anyway thank you very much i would probably look listen to the replay and uh, and, and so forth thank you very much peter uh, i was only say that uh, i did uh, i am using ma mainly six semi the flow theory because I like really is thinking of the mastery when you have the right challenges related to your skills. That is the way forward. And also Ericsson, the known, very known Swedish researcher was in Florida for many years, uh, working on skill development and, and excellent. And I, I'm trying to link that to our passion thinking, this passion for assignment, because Ericsson's theory was fantastic because he was saying everyone, can increase their knowledge or skills by deliberate practice or focusing on that kind. And that is really forward thinking. And I like that with Arizona. I'm trying to integrate both Arizona and in my uh, 
motivational factors uh, thinking. And I think, uh, and I'm, I will say that, Katrina, to the group that everyone can send me an email and I will try to answer it. I would really love to have some cooperation with some of the people if they want in the future. Yeah, the, the thing, can I just add the thing there to Ericsson? Yeah. The yeah. thing with, the, the way I see it is that a whole lot of learning and the way we get brain programs or mental models that are, they are invisible. We learn them invisibly and indeliberately. So we don't even know when they are executed. What I think that you're kind of looking towards and what that would probably align with the way I see it is that you need to create models that are simple, that are visible and deliberate in order to have a chance to create effective and very, very rapid learning, which aligns to with Anders Ericsson's uh, yes. thoughts uh, as far as I see it. So anyway, I kept you a minute or so long you're here, but uh, that that's very interesting because I, I I think that we're looking at similar things. So so it, and it would be interesting if I, I followed you on the app here and if we can get your email address, I'm, then I will connect. Yes, thank you very much, Peter. I would like to hear from you. Um, yes. I will also be happy to make the connection if you send me an email, Peter, I will, I will forward it. Yes. Great. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your really very interesting and very important work here with us. Um, I hope a lot of schools around the world and school districts will adopt the system and, um, that's the hope. <laughs> and I'm glad you found your passion in this and that you do this wonderful work for all of us and our children. So thank you so much. And um, we wish you all the best and we will follow your work. You already mentioned the, the paper that is about to come out. So yeah, we'll be yes. looking forward to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katrina, for inviting me. And thank you for the, for the talk. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. And thanks everyone for coming and asking questions. Uh, it's always way more interesting if more people ask questions and comment. It makes a discussion uh, much richer. And uh, if you like discussions like this, uh, Dr. Gaybert will be talking about a lightweight robotic leg prosthesis. Um, so, yeah, if you it's a very different discussion, but I think it will be really interesting and it will be later today at 8 p.m. EST. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. I hope I hear you all again and, uh, yeah, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Thank you, Bye, Katarina. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Katarina, nice I sent you an email and. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I'll, I'll forward that email then to to and, and also if you could share uh, what I asked I sent I, I had a comment there so anyway thank you okay Bye. yeah sure thank you bye